Ladies and gentlemen, Dave Chappelle. Thank you. Oh boy, I'm very nervous. Uh, no pressure. Uh, during the civil rights movement, uh, the, I can't, I can't read what's on the teleprompter. <laughs> Some about black America and white America. <laughs> there's black Americans and there's white Americans. We're all one America. So, so if you don't mind, this is a, this is not live, is it? I imagine whatever I say, you could just you could just edit it out. Let's try it a few ways. Lou, are you in the booth? I am. All right, good. Uh, you know what, Lou? Let's just play around with it and see if we can get it right. Get this clip package on, and then, and then let me go home. All right? Yeah. All right. Ready. All right. Count me in. Five, four, three, two, one. Wu Tang. I'm just <laughs> with you, Lou. Let's do it again. <laughs> We're gonna do it again. We'll get it right. Here we go, Dave. <laughs> Five, four, three, two. You know, when I was a comedian starting out in Washington, D.C., right here in this city, 1988, I'll never forget this, it was a comedy club owner that banned profanity from his comedy club. He said it offended his audience, and this was a, a cause of major concern for all the comedians in the circuit. And we all called a meeting, and we had the owners come, and it was the club owners, and it was the comedians. It was the classic labor dispute. <laughs> the club owners laid out their case. There cannot be profanity in these clubs, because that offends people. And there's a comedian who's still a good friend of mine to this day. He lives right here in Washington, D.C. He stood up. And he said, he's black, I should tell you, because it's important to the story. <laughs> he says, I use profanity because I live a profane lifestyle. <laughs> he says, I don't have an insect infestation in my house. I have roaches. <laughs> my favorite comedians are like musicians. And the audience is their instrument. And the music they make is your laughter. And that's the laughter that I scored my entire life to. So now, some of my favorite American comedic composers. Thank you. When I lose my job, I lose my man. Treat me like a dog, he called me a dog. Yes, he did, what did he call me an old dog? Sometimes I wish I was a dog and he was a tree. <laughs> when you stop and think, football's a fair sport for my people. Only sport in the world, a Negro can chase a white man and 40,000 people stand up and cheer. <laughs> See, in my neighborhood, the kids have a kind of a dubious reaction to that whole Santa Claus concept. They just don't believe that a white man will ride a reindeer through Harlem after midnight. <laughs> In truth, white friend, it's you that all look alike. <laughs> but look at the black people around you. We're all different colors. Black walnut, burnt out almond, <laughs> chocolate, chocolate mocha, pecan, vanilla, yellow, mellow, light, bright, and damn near white. We come from the first people on the earth. <laughs> you know, the first people on the earth were black people. We the first people had thought. Right? We was the first one to say, where the am I? <laughs> and how do you get to Detroit? I think maybe like 30 years ago, there was a woman that wanted to sing, and a black lady that sang opera, that wanted to sing, what was her name? <laughs> Mary Anderson. And this place was, was like segregated, and they couldn't sing here. And here we are like not even 50 years later, a 22-year-old black man on stage getting paid to hold his God bless America. I gotta go now. Y'all take it easy. Bye bye. Janelle Monet, Will Smith, Common, Gladys Knight, and John Legend. When we continue. <laughs> yeah, man. Well, you ladies are right. To be honest with you, your lives look terrifying to me. They do, man. I know nothing about being a woman, but I know fear. Yo, I used to live in New York when I was 17. 
And I couldn't even pay my bills. You know what I did to make money? I used to do shows for drug dealers that wanted to clean their money up. And one time I did a real good set, and these motherfuckers called me in the back room. They gave me $25,000 in cash. It's probably 18, 19 years old. I'm scared. I thanked them profusely. I put that money in my backpack. I jumped on the subway and started heading towards Brooklyn at one o'clock in the morning. Never been that terrified in my life. Because I'd never in my life had something that somebody else would want. I thought to myself, Jesus Christ, if motherfuckers knew how much money I had in this backpack, they'd kill me for it. Then I thought, holy shit. What if I had a pussy on me all the time? That's what women are dealing with. I'm gonna tell you right now. <laughs> it's real talk. If them same drug dealers gave me a pussy and said, put this in your backpack and take it to Brooklyn, I'd be like, nigga, I can't accept this. <laughs> I empathize, man, you know. Everybody gets mad because I say these jokes. But you understand that this is the best time to say them. More now than ever. And I know there's some comedians in the back. Motherfucker, you have a responsibility to speak recklessly. Otherwise... <laughs> New York Times said uh, that Louis C.K. jizzed on his own stomach. <laughs> You know, I've busted a lot of nuts in my day. None of them were newsworthy. <laughs> <laughs> Shit was really gross. Because they didn't just say it like I said it. They didn't just say jizz on the stomach. They said it in that fucking Pulitzer Prize winning style that the New York Times has. It was very descriptive. Like, you know what I mean? Louis C.K.'s semen shot out like a volcano of misogyny. <laughs> Slowly Jizzling down like lava, <laughs> covering his freckled penis as it slowly dripped to a fiery crown of red hair. <laughs> like, Jesus Christ, I'm trying to eat some Wavell's Rancheros, and these niggas is. <laughs> and you know, the tough part being a comedian, knowing the motherfuckers. Everybody comes up to me like, did you know? Did you know what Louie was doing? No, bitch, I did not know. <laughs> the fuck you think we talk about at the comedy club? Hey, nigga, how was the weekend? Great, man, I was just jerking off in faces and coming on my own stomach, having a good time. You know how this business is. <laughs> no, I didn't know. They act like we sit around like grease. Tell me more, tell me more. Did she put up a fight? Dun, 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 dun. <laughs> Sorry, I don't know the choreography, but you get the point. You get the point. <laughs> she was intense. But Louis was like the turning point. I mean, you know, I, all these allegations are terrible. Louis was the only... <laughs> I shouldn't say this, but fuck it. His, his allegation was the only one that made me, like, laugh. <laughs> well, if you think about it... <laughs> All his friends reading it, and he's jerking off, and he's surprising people. He's surprising me. <laughs> I just picture all the comics and comedy just reading it, like, what? <laughs> it's terrible. I know it's terrible. I'm sorry, ladies. You're right. You are right. But at the same time, I mean, you know what I mean? I don't know. Jesus Christ, they took everything from Louis. I was like, I don't know, it might be disproportionate. I can't tell. I can't tell. This is like where it's hard to be a man. One lady said, Louis C.K. masturbating in front of me ruined my comedy dreams. Were? <laughs> <laughs> well, then I dare say, madam, you may have never had a dream. Come on, man, that's a brittle spirit. <laughs> that is a brittle-ass spirit, nigga. That shit is too much. It's a grown-ass woman. 
You know what this shit is like? It's like COINTELPRO. You know what that is? It's a program that the FBI had on the Jagger of Hoover. And this program, one of the many things they did was they would track the sexual habits of anyone they considered an enemy of the state. It was a lip button. That's why they got all these fucking sex tapes with Martin Luther King fucking bitches. But lucky for us, he actually had a dream. <laughs> you think if Louis C.K. jerked off in front of Dr. King, he'd be like, I can't continue this movement. I'm sorry, but the freedom of black people must be stopped. I didn't know this nigga was gonna pull his dick out and jerk off like this. I just thought we were gonna get a couple of drinks and chill. <laughs> Show business is just harder than that. Them women are sounding like, I hate to say it, y'all, they're sounding weak. I know it sounds fucked up, I'm not supposed to say that, but one of these ladies was like, Louis C.K. was masturbating while I was on the phone with him. Bitch, you don't know how to hang up a phone? How the fuck are you going to survive in show business if this is an actual obstacle to your dreams? I know Louis is wrong, ma'am. I'm just saying I'm held to a higher standard of accountability than these women are. Don't forget who I am. Don't forget what I am. I am a black dude. <laughs>
was kneeling during the national anthem. <laughs> That's a brittle spirit. That's right, nigga. On the rock, it's regular. Ah! Ah! What are you doing, nigga? Stand up! He stretched the art form and uh, his impact on the culture. Uh, he is the voice of his generation, without question. Nobody's even close to him. No, I've had to learn, and that's where um, Dave Chappelle was um has been a wonderful friend and mentor what did Chappelle say to you that helped you with that? Chappelle said to me we were we were um doing a show at uh, radio city together it was during his run right and i was on, i was on one of the shows and he said to me i said man I, like what am i gonna tell these because i was like i'm gonna do comedy before dave Chappelle. i was like dave uh, what am i even doing here <laughs> and dave said great. and i said i don't even know if i'm funny enough to be here i said you're nice and i think i'm a really funny guy but what am i doing here and dave said look man he said you don't understand something he said you're not here because you're funny he says, I know a hundred funny motherfuckers out there. He said, you're here because you're interesting. And he said, anyone can be funny. Not everybody can be interesting. Not everyone can make an audience listen to what they're saying. Not everyone has a wealth of life experience that makes people want to know what they have in their minds. And so that changed my perspective on silence. And so now if I can hear that an audience is listening, I'm engaged. Well, that is a great piece of advice, not only for comics, but for, for anybody. Right. Because, wow, the thing that I love about Chappelle, and you just identified it, is he will go. He's interesting. And he is an interesting he's the guy. Most, he's the most interesting man I've ever met. That's, that's, yeah, that's what makes Dave Chappelle. People, many people are funny. There's a lot of funny stand-up comedians all over the world. Yes. But what makes Dave Chappelle Dave Chappelle is that he is interesting it's how he sees the world between the jokes but all jokes aside ken spacey shouldn't have done that shit to that kid he's 14 years old and was forced to carry a grown man's secret for 30 years jesus christ he must have been busting at the seams with that one the saddest part is if he were able to carry that secret for six more months i would get to know how house of cards ends <laughs> I loved was um, I can't believe that I've been in this business long enough that we're like the older guys now. It always blows my mind that I'm like five years older than Dave Chappelle because he was already a made guy when I came in. So I always look at him like he's got 10 years on me, you know, or 15. And, you know, just when I watch his act, I'm like, this guy's clearly been doing this a good couple of decades longer than me. And the reality is I think he's only been doing it like six years longer than I have or something like that. He's fucking amazing. And what I love too is just, he's that same, um, with all that's changed, everybody getting offended, all of this fucking crap, how you get in trouble. He hasn't changed at all. He's just like that same guy that I saw way back in the day when I used to go to the Boston Comedy Club and watch him go on at like 2 in the morning and just start murdering at 2 in the fucking morning. And I remember he's always sit there going, how, the, how do you do that? How do you get that funny at 2 in the morning in front of a crowd that gave up on the show like an hour ago and they're tired and they just want to go home? That second he steps on stage, boom, he just like, he just starts fucking killing. Dave's a beast. Dave's a beast, man. That's the only man, only man that puts a little fear in my heart. I'm like, okay, it's real. What's he doing? Do you watch him? Do you oh, watch totally. him? Totally. You study? Totally, totally. I got the, I got, I got Chappelle. I got an app. I follow him. I'm like, you know, my man P Prince Paul always says, competition keeps you in condition. True. You know, so yeah, that's that's my man right there. The other real special shout out I gotta make, because none of this would have been possible on any level. Uh, without this person is my mother. Mom. My mother. Mom, 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 mom. You have no idea what I put this woman through. <laughs> if you had just given birth to me, that would have been more than enough. But the fact that she raised me and raised me well, we had a real oral tradition in our house. I knew the word griot when I was a little boy. A griot was a person in Africa 
who's charged with keeping the stories of the village. Everyone would tell Grio the stories and they would remember them all so that they could tell future generations. And when they got old, they'd tell them to someone else. And they say in Africa, when a Grio dies, it's like a library was burnt down. And my mother used to tell me, before I ever thought about doing comedy, she said, you should be a Grio. And she'd fill me with every story of black life. You know, she's educated in African-American studies. And she would let me understand the context that I was being raised in, that I'm being raised in a hostile environment that I have to tame. By the time I was 14 years old, I was in nightclubs, mastering an adult world. It was terrifying. The crack epidemic was going on, and my mother would hear gunshots outside and be scared to death. Maybe it's my son. But early in my career, if you remember, Mom, you used to sit in the club with me. So you'd do a full day of work, you'd be back there falling asleep just waiting for me to go on. She would watch my show every night. Do you know how long that car ride is home? <laughs> how many of you have ever heard your mother say, pussy jokes were a little too much tonight, son? <laughs> I was a soft kid. I was sensitive, I'd cry easy, and I would be scared to fist fight. And my mother used to tell me this thing, I don't even know if you remember, but you said this to me more than once. You said, son, sometimes you have to be a lion so you can be the lamb you really are. I talk this shit like a lion. I'm not afraid of any of you when it comes word to word. I will gab with the best of them just so I can chill and be me. And that's why I love my art form, because I understand every practitioner of it, whether I agree with them or not, I know where they're coming from. They want to be heard, they got something to say, there's something they notice, they just want to be understood. Love this genre, it saved my life. Now let's think about this. You've heard them on their radios, on television, you've read their newspapers, you've even talked to them in your beer houses. Why do they call us? They call us Anglo Fools. They call you Anglo Fools. And they've called all of us be our friends. Are we be our friends? They call us enemies in their house. That's not the truth. The truth is, they stole our rights. You know that. They destroyed our wealth. Call us Cameroonians. We are Amazonians. You know, Amazonia is not a dream, it's a reality. And let's talk to Amazonia. Ambazona, you were lost and abused, abused. Now you are found. We have found you. We pledge our lives to set you free forever. Free. We won't let you down. And this is our promise to you. Nobody could ever take this promise away and we will not budge one step back. comes down to you and me. You have to join our pledge and, and play your part. It's my part and your part to make it. You and me will set it free because freedom is the word. Don't let them lie to you. There's nothing else but freedom. Freedom is our right and in that right.